uh, advice on how to read in a foreign language. And we are streaming on YouTube, uh, apparently. Okay, so Anna, please. So, well, you know me, I am uh, Anna Torquat, right? And uh, last class, which, which was our first class in the book a month of the open class series, um, it was with me and now it's uh, without us. So you get the opportunity to see uh, how both of us teach, right? Because we are the two teachers of a book a month. And uh, I was the one who started a company. Um, I am an, I'm a teacher. I'm also a researcher. Um, I have in the last year, uh, which was the year when Aru joined us as a professor, as a teacher in, in a book a month, it was my year of doing my postdoc. I was doing this postdoc, which is a collaboration between German institutions and Latin American institutions, um, which was financed by the University of Cologne and it's based in Sao Paulo. So we were living in Sao Paulo uh, for that year. Um, and it was uh, an interdisciplinary postdoc, mostly in my case, it was mostly uh, focused on literature, right, on comparative literature. My PhD is also in comparative literature. I've uh, done the basis of it in uh, the Federal University of Panama, but I've also done an exchange program in uh, Germany, in Berlin. And my master's was completely um, uh, abroad, right? I did a multi-institutional Erasmus Mundus master, which uh, starts in, started in, uh, in Lisbon, in the Nova University uh, of Lisbon. And then I moved to England, to the University of Sheffield, Sheffield. Uh, for all of you, uh, all of you who don't know the city because it's the smallest city in the north of England, it's actually the city of the Arctic Monkeys. Have you ever heard of this beautiful band before? <laughs> this is where they <laughs> also Def Leppard. If you like metal, uh, Def Leppard and Arctic Monkeys are from Sheffield, right? Um, is in the same line of uh, Manchester. And uh, then I ended up in Spain in the University of Santiago de Compostela, right? Uh, while Aureo, um, I, I think let all of you have heard of him before, not only as a teacher of a book a month, but also as the podcast, podcast, podcast host of Literatura Viral. Probably some of you have reached a book a month through um, uh, Literatura Viral. And he is, well, what happened with the PDF? Okay, all right. So, sorry. So he's just like he has done his PhD in the University of Padua in comparative literature in medical humanities. Um, and he has specialized in telling the history, the literary history of the representation of cholera uh, in his PhD. And also, also he has done his master's uh, in the same kind of uh, multi-institutional uh, program as I. So he studied in uh, the University of Bologna uh, in Italy, then in France in the University of Strasbourg, and then in the end in Greece at the University of um, Thessaloniki, right? So for those of you who are fans of Literatura Viral, tomorrow we have a new episode, right? So if you are wishing to hear the, the third season, you're going to be very um, excited to hear about it. Literatura Viral is then his podcast. It has started in the beginning of the corona pandemics, right? And um, is mostly dedicated to analyzing how the representation of illnesses and epidemics is uh, performed in the arts and literature and music and other types of cultural expressions. And some of these episodes here, he has already analyze um, some of the authors that we have studied in the book a month previously, for example, Edgar Allan Poe, um, and also uh, Philip Roth that we have here in the yellow part. And in this episode, uh, in the um, uh, in this uh, bottom uh, right, it's the one that I participate with him. So probably you have heard this one um, uh, with both of us speaking, right? So uh, move on, please. Okay, guys, so after presenting to you our uh, curriculum, just to, uh, to prove that we, we know what we're talking about, 
Um, uh, I would have to, to tell you what a book a month is. In the case you don't know what it is, it is actually put it simply, it is a method of to, to practice and improve language while learning about literature. Or if you want to put the other way around, we learn about literature and as a collateral effect, as a second degree effect, we improve our language, okay? And, and then the, the, the next question you might be asking is why? Why to do that? Why to study literature in, in a foreign language? Why not doing it directly in Portuguese as we do in high school, for example? And then I would, I would argue that there are three groups of answers, two, three uh, different areas of arguments that we could present, three advantages, okay? So one direction is um, linguistic, obviously. Literature is authentic material. Literature is challenging um, in any language, okay? So when you read uh, literature in Portuguese, uh, you, you feel challenged. And actually, if you want to, to, to make your Portuguese better, if you want to improve your language, your mother language, you will actually read, right? So the same thing applies to a foreign language. Um, it expands your language awareness, uh, and, and it goes way beyond learning a few words, a few uh, uh, learning vocabulary. Of course, you're going to absorb vocabulary by reading, but it goes way beyond that. It goes, it goes on, on, on to deeper levels of grammar, syntax, morphology, pragmatics, and etc. So there are many, and, and cultural awareness as well, right? And, and one great thing about expanding your, the language awareness is also that um, that happens in context, and which means that you absorb much more. It means you can go much further because you don't feel like studying. You feel like you're reading and having fun. So, uh, and if you're having fun, if you're enjoying what you're doing, you are much more likely to do it more often and to do it for longer, right? And, 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 and there are many studies in linguistics that show that once you learn something in context, uh, especially when when it's when you're talking about language, um, it sticks. Okay, so you you remember that if and and that's very simple to to um, you know when when you learn how to sing a song in which there are many words that you do not know. Okay, you will learn those words very fast. If you try to learn the same words in a list like out outside of a context, uh, if you just like read it uh, one after the other. Uh, it would be much, much, much more difficult. It is possible, but much tougher, okay? So these are linguistic advantages, but there are also a lot of social advantages of doing that because literature is motivating, okay? It, it can be frustrating as well. And sometimes it's tough, but most of the time we read stuff that we like. Uh, we read uh, things that we are interested in, right? So it is not motivating and it keeps us going. And it also encourages interaction. Uh, I don't know if, if, if all of you will remember those days before social media, uh, but actually uh, back then it was difficult to meet people that, that had the same interest as, as you did, okay? So once you met someone in the bus perhaps that was reading the same book as you, you would become image, immediately uh, instant best friends, okay? So, um, uh, Literature encourages such interaction. And this is a very powerful tool in order to learn and to practice language. And another social advantage of literature is that it educates the whole person, right? So it will give you much more than the linguistics, but, but actually uh, other levels. And this brings us to the third direction, which is intellectual, right? Literature is, is pretty much awesome and will offer you much on the realms of philosophy, anthropology, history, and so on. I won't, I, I, I take that to be self-evident, so I won't even go too, too much to, to explore uh, this direction too, too much, okay? So this is why we think it's very interesting to combine uh, foreign language and uh, literary studies. And one thing that before we go into the, the advice, the tips, one thing that I, I really want to highlight and to emphasize is that we do the talk and we walk the walk. So um, 
this is not something that I we've we've learned in uh, I don't know like you know the coaches and in those things you know like quantic uh, uh, we haven't been hugging a few trees and then we learned this stuff no we have been doing this for years and actually uh, what we practice in class uh, it's something that we do on a daily basis on a daily basis actually we've been there and we are there um, in uh, to to a very high degree. Anna speaks five languages. I speak six. Uh, we are cheating a little bit because I'm counting Portuguese there. So th those are not all foreign languages. Uh, you can um, you can detract one if you if you please. Uh, so we have been and, and of course we're not uh, uh, we we are not a hundred percent fluent uh, in all of them. We have we speak all of them and we understand all of them into different levels because that's. It's normal. I mean, um, um, so we we know how it is, the, the process, the difficulties, the challenges that we face in every single step of the way. We we know uh, them quite uh, quite well, actually. We have been studying abroad. Anna has uh, taken her her masters in England and in other countries, as she explained uh, a few minutes ago. I. I I pursued my PhD in the University of Padua in Italy. And before that, I took my master's also in Italy in the University of Bologna. And so we have lived for extensive years abroad and we have also written abroad um, my, in a foreign language, sorry. My, my master's thesis was written in Italian and my PhD thesis was written in English. So once again, writing in a foreign language is it's, it's, it's quite a different thing. Uh, and, and it's an experience that really um, teaches you a few things uh, about that. Uh, Anna, can you can you share with us your experience with with Spanish, please? Sure. Just asking if you can all listen to me because now I'm traumatized. <laughs> all right, cool people. So uh, the thing is, um, I don't know if this is a sentiment that all Brazilians might feel with Spanish that we feel insecure of like being bearers of uh, Spanish speaking people uh, speaking Portuguese or something like that, which I think at this point in life, we already recognize that Portuguese is another language, right? Probably yet to be recognized, but it's something that has, uh, it's, it's in the process, we have to say. But the thing is, I was always a little bit, um, I don't know, like I, I was always trying to improve my, my Spanish, but not very much into it. And well, and then there was a time that I was doing my master's in uh, a Spanish speaking country in uh, Spain, right? Um, in Santiago de Compostela. And I had to, right? So I had to. And I, in the beginning, I lacked effort. And in the beginning, I lacked interest. But then I fell in love with the language, with the culture, with the people. And I started doing my own thing. I never took formal classes in uh, Spanish before, right? And this is the thing. I have always been a self-taught uh, person in, when it comes to Spanish. I think with English a little bit as well, but I think with Spanish a little bit more. And I have at the time like employ myself into going to classes and attending all the classes in Spanish, speaking with my friends uh, at the time and also downloading all the apps and reading everything that I could in Spanish so I could actually incorporate and embody the language and therefore be able to produce. So when I arrived in Spanish, everybody uh, used to, to play with me that, that I would try to, to speak in English with uh, the Spanish speaking people. And they, they don't really speak English that much. It's not uh, something that um, they do, that, at least in that region of Spain. And I was a little bit more silent for a month. And then suddenly everybody was just like, ah, she speaks. And suddenly I felt more comfortable in being able to speak Spanish uh, with everybody. And then this is where the social part of the master's degree started. And I am proud to say that last year I gave my first academic lecture in Spanish and it was a success. Everybody understood me. So <laughs> I'm glad that I have wrote this path because it was um, sometimes arduous, right? <laughs> um, and the same thing, I think uh, it happens with German, but the thing with German, I have taken some formal classes before. I moved to Berlin to do my, my PhD, right? 
I wanted to get ahead and to be able to go there, at least speaking a little bit. And when I moved to Berlin, I was about like pre-intermediate A2, right? If you, if you get those terms. And I started trying to be like less self-conscious about German and it would speak with everyone. In the beginning, it was traumatizing. I went to buy um, a ticket to go to an Incubus, uh, the band's concert, and the guy started laughing at me and he, uh, he changed to English and it was like, no, you're not gonna change it. You're gonna to speak to me, uh, you're going to speak with me in German, even though it's broken German. Please do it so. I'm doing my best here. <laughs> Just follow along. And then he laughed and he tried. And this is what I kept doing for this, uh, the whole period that I was in Berlin. In Berlin, I didn't study because I was writing my thesis, so I didn't really have the time to do it. I spent most of my time writing and researching at the archive. Um, but later on, when I came back to Brazil and I started the book a month, uh, I think that uh, this project actually started also inspiring other teachers uh, to do the same kind of method with other languages. And this is what this was what uh, my friend uh, Angelica, who is a very good friend of mine, studied with me um, in the university. Uh, she's a German teacher, and she elaborated a course uh, that teaches um, short stories in German. And we would meet uh, twice a week, right, to to discuss the short stories. And I got to see, like, I got to to um, uh, to uh, make proof of how it works, right. I noticed a huge difference in my German in only two months, of course. And uh, for me, I think it was a, like the most beneficial part of studying German, right, because I would see the language in context. And I also had fun because I was reading very interesting people, Nobel Prizes, some people who were very important for the history of language. So it was super great. So this is my story with German and maybe uh, Audio would like to share his story with German as well. Um, I'm not so sure because, um, you know, guys, life is too short to learn German, right? <laughs> So I have studied a little bit by myself and I've taken two semesters of German, but it's a language that I mostly read um, and with, with uh, at an intermediate level with, with quite a lot of difficulties, but it's something that I really uh, do every now and then because uh, one day I would like to, to read Nietzsche and Schopenhauer in the original. So yeah, perhaps in like 20 or 30 years, but let's uh, and one thing that I have been doing, though, is uh, a few years back, I've been to Barcelona and I, I got a book about uh, architecture and, and I read it and I understood, like I read two paragraphs and I understood everything. And then I was like, what the hell is wrong with this book? And actually the book, it was in Catalan. And, 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 and since I speak French and Italian and, and Spanish, I could, I could understand, it, but, but it's in Catalan. It was... Uh, it was also pretty funny and, and weird. And, and after that, I got really excited about Catalan. And so I started to, to study it. And I have combined that with our teaching in a book a month. So last semester, for example, our uh, students were reading Agatha Christie's Five Little Pigs. And you know, Agatha Christie is not so tough to read. Uh, and so I decided to get uh, that in, in, in Catalan. I could not find it. So uh, I, I, go, I got, uh, and then there were none. In, in, in Catalan. And, and so I read this in Catalan while our stu students were reading it in English, just to mimic the kind of difficulties that our students find themselves in. Uh, the same thing uh, we are, uh, it's the same thing we're doing. And, and this was successful. And so after that, we were also reading The Lost Daughter by Elena Ferrante. Uh, it's an, she's an Italian author, but we read it in a translation in English. And, and the same thing happened again. I, I came across this audiobook, La Figlia Posca, in, in Catalan. And so I decided to, to, to listen to it um, just to mimic the same kind of process. Okay. So we're, we're saying that just to, and, and finally we get into the advice. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it took us so long, but, but I think this, this, uh, these preliminaries are, are quite important, actually. Um, um, to, to, to tell you, to prove to you that. Uh, we do the we we do the talk, but we also walk the walk. Okay, so how to in a foreign language? Uh, I try to organize a few tips that uh, I've given out to to 
friends over the years to our students. Then me and Anna, we talked a lot about this and, and got into a few of them. There are a few others perhaps that, that we also share in our courses. And I think one of the first things that we have to, to get flat straight at the beginning is that reading in a foreign language is about managing your expectations, okay? Uh, you will understand less, that's a fact, okay? You will read slower, that's also a fact. It's not your native language. And, and, and even in your native language, even in Portuguese, if you have to read a children's story, um, it's easier than Machado de Assis, which is easier than Guimarães Rosa, you know? So, so even in, in our own languages, um, um, the, depending on the type of text, depending on the type of author, your reading abilities will shift and, and that's okay, okay? Uh, and, and I think there's also another thing that we have to take into the equation is that our brains have been like bombarded with social media for quite a few years already. And I don't know about you guys, but I nowadays, I have the, the attention span of like a mollusk or a, 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 I don't know, like an invertebrate for sure, okay? So nowadays it's tougher and tougher, I feel, to, to concentrate on reading, okay? So I, I feel that I myself read, I read a lot, but still I feel that I, I have the impression I used to be a better reader in, in times of speed and understanding and concentration. So all of this play a role when we try to read in English, in Italian, in German, in French, whatever. Okay, so we have to manage our expectations. This brings us to the second tip. Um, the, the, we should see challenge, okay? If you want to become Arnold Schwarzenegger, you won't do that by lifting uh, 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 stuff, stuff, you know? Uh, you have to lift heavy weights. You have to sweat. It has to be challenge, challenging. Uh, the things that, it, however, we have to, to be able to understand when something is challenging, but which gives you a, a, a nice percentage of, of difficulty. And, and sometimes challenging becomes too hard, becomes impossible, becomes self-beating, uh, okay? So we have to draw the line there, uh, something that is difficult enough to be challenging and to allow for personal growth, but not too too hard, so hard that you actually give up and, and, and cannot really absorb anything and cannot get anything good out of it, only stress and anxiety. So if it's too hard, you have to understand why, why, why is that, okay? So perhaps vocabulary is owed. You know, if you read uh, George Amado is much easier than if you read Camões, which is much easier if you read, I don't know if you guys ever tried to read medieval Portuguese. It's quite an experience. I had to do it at college. Uh, and, and at some point you, you even think it's Latin or something because it's irrecognizable. It looks like another language. So the further back you go in time, the tougher uh, it becomes. Of course, that, that is a general rule. It doesn't apply in all cases, but anyway. So uh, if you try to read Shakespeare, obviously it's gonna be much more difficult than reading something contemporary. Something a bit less self-evident, however, is informal language, okay? When we hear informal Portuguese, it's quite easy to understand, but when we read, when we read or listen informal, English or informal, whatever, um, it's tough, okay? So reading slangs, reading regional dialects, they are very difficult. So this could be at the root of the problem, for example. One, one simple example to, to you guys, uh, to, to give to you guys, um, Steinbeck, okay? Amazing author, has been touched by the finger of God. Uh, everything the guy has written is amazing. Um, and, and perhaps you have tried to read Of Mice and Men. It's quite an easy reading in Portuguese. If you try to read in a translation, it's a beautiful book, very poetic, very easy to understand. But if you try to do it in English, you will notice that it's freaking tough because it's all about Texan, you know, like local dialects, a lot of slangs, a lot of 
chunking and broken English, broken grammar. So it demands a lot from a foreign, uh, from a from a foreigner. Okay, uh, sometimes the problem it's not in the vocabulary itself, but on, on in the structure, in grammar, syntax. It's too complicated. It could be simple words, but organized in in a way that is convoluted and 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 messy. Okay, and sometimes. It's not the language at all, it's, it's the theme. Perhaps you're trying to read an article in astrophysics and you're not understanding much and you think it is because it's in English, but in fact, it's because it's freaking astrophysics. I mean, uh, of course it's tough, okay? So sometimes it's, it's not so easy to spot. Uh, we understand that something is going on, but we don't really understand why uh, we are meeting certain difficulties. And this is quite evident as well when we get to read literature, because we, one, one practical example, last semester, we were reading Slaughterhouse, uh, Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut, very funny book about a guy that is uh, abducted by aliens and, and fights in World War II. It's super funny. Uh, and it's easy, like from the linguistic point of view, it's not so complicated, short sentences, at normal everyday vocabulary. However, the structure of the book, it's very messy because the book is achronologic. Um, the book, it, it contradicts itself the entire time. You don't know that perhaps the guy has not even been abducted by aliens, but perhaps he's just crazy. So the, the structure, the literary structure is very complex. And because of that, our students were having a kind of a hard time, you know, to, to, to get it through. But it was not because of language. It's what, it was because of the literary organization of that book. And, and you know, the, the, this is the entire fun. So it was challenging, but it was very, very rewarding. They, they all loved it. Okay. So, so if it's too hard, I advise you guys to, to try to understand it, to spot why is it. So because once you know what, where the difficulty lies, then you can tackle it with, with different strategies, okay? Another thing you may try is fiction for young adults. We, we, study all, we all study literature at some point in our lives, at high school or at university, and often literary critics are dismissive of certain genres, okay? Uh, they frown upon children's literature, they frown upon adult novel, uh, young adult novels, sometimes sci-fi, sometimes uh, ghost stories. And, and, and that's a pity, okay? We're both literary critics, so I know what, what I'm talking about. And, and we differ on that. We, we do not, we and, and many other people uh, do not really agree with, with frowning at certain genres. All genres allow for great artistry. And, and there are great, there, there are good young adult novels and there are bad young adult novels. So, so you could, search for the good ones. And here are a few examples. They're much easier to read. They, they, are, uh, they will keep you motivated. Uh, and, and you know, sometimes you read them in a sitting. So, so these are the ones that um, you could point to, especially when you're struggling to solidify your habit, okay? So just to give you a few examples, The Hobbit, Stardust by Neil Gaiman, or anything that Neil Gaiman wrote, because the guy is, is great, A Wrinkle in Time. All of these are books that we have read here in the book month. And, and The Wizard of Oz is, is one that we'll be reading in the, this semester uh, from February onwards. Another thing you might try is uh, using genres that are more motivating. So sci-fi, detective stories, ghost stories. They, you know, they, they have something, they, they usually, these genres are based on plot. So usually ghost stories, sci-fi and detective novels, they offer to us uh, a, a, nice, a nice plot, a, 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 a nice uh, chain of events. We want to know what happens. We want, we want to know who killed uh, the, the main character. We want to know if that was a real ghost or it was just a hoax of some kind. So since we want to get to the end of the story, once again, you will read it for longer, you will read it more often, you will be motivated to look for certain vocabulary and for certain uh, uh, grammatical structures, okay? And, and once you learn this, you're much less likely to forget because you care about this, okay? 
So, and all of these are also different narratives that we have studied uh, throughout the years. The Hunting of Hill House is one of my favorites of every time. If you haven't read, please do. You deserve this, okay? Um, yeah, perhaps Santa Claus will bring you this next time for Christmas if you're a, a good boy or a good girl. Uh, okay, third tip. Um, search for something you care about, okay? It goes into the same direction. Uh, I, I always advise my, my students, uh, and many years ago when I used to teach Italian, I would be saying exactly the same thing to my Italian students. Uh, use language as a means, not as an end in itself. So rather than studying English per se, try to do something that you care about. So if you love gardening, great. So get a few gardening books in, in, in English and go for it. Watch a few, I don't know, uh, YouTube videos about the things that you like and do that in a foreign language. I guess that all of you guys uh, already do this. So uh, perhaps I'm, sta the, the, I'm stating the obvious, but, but when it comes to literature, that's not so clear, at least in my experience, I, I, I think uh, it's very self-evident for you too, but not so much when, it, when we enter into the realm of, of books, okay? Number four. And, and you guys have already realized by this point that many of these tips, they're good for reading, but they're, they're good for life in general. Because, <laughs> yep, uh, practice makes perfect, guys. So be consistent, okay? You won't turn into Arnold Schwarzenegger into a week after you got into the gym. It will take a few years. Uh, so if you want to... Um, if you want to know about literature in general, even if you're reading into Port in Portuguese, literature is so vast. And, and any, even a small book, like, I don't know, a 200 book of 200 pages, it takes what, six, eight, 10 hours to read? So how fast can you read a book that is tiny? It takes, I don't know, two days, a week, a month. So literature takes time. And if you want to get an extensive knowledge about Brazilian literature, for example, it takes years. Actually, it takes an entire lifetime, okay? So um, uh, we cannot, and, and this is only about literature. If, you, if you're trying to do that and learning uh, uh, foreign languages and, and practicing foreign languages, um, you really need to be consistent, okay? So um, you should not give up. Uh, perhaps if, if something is too hard, try to realize uh, why perhaps it's, you know, beyond your league. It's too tough for you. Your level does not allow that one, and that's okay. So you step one, one step further. Uh, get back a little bit, you know. Listen to the minimalists. Little less can mean more, okay? So use progressions in a smart way. Um, for example, reading young adult novels, they offer you naturally a progression because young adult novels, usually they have uh, um, a, more, a simpler vocabulary, a simpler syntax, okay? Don't expect immediate transformation and keep in mind that results, they may not be easy to measure, okay? Um, I wish there was a very easy way, you know, like that, that my, uh, phone, uh, I don't know, like Apple Watch or something could tell me, today your, your English has improved 3%, but it, it's not easy to measure, okay? So, you know, I, I'm a terrible singer. Uh, and when I watch people singing, I can recognize an amazing singer. When, when you know, when somebody who sings amazingly starts singing, I'm like, wow, she sings so well. I don't know why exactly. I don't know. I, I can't tell you. Oh, yeah, she's really, she has this technique and she has this. I, I don't know. But I, I understand that she's a freaking amazing singer. Okay. And I can distinguish between good singers and bad singers, but I don't know really why. This, it, it's precisely what we're talking about here. It's it results are not so easy to measure. So it, it really, in my experience and in the experience of many of our students, um, in the beginning of the semester, uh, and when you compare yourself in the beginning of the semester and then four or five months down the road, you can see a lot of progress. Okay, You can see that you're much better, but you, you can't really point 
point out to what what happened along the way. So keep this in mind because it's easy to get frustrated uh, because we are living in a world that is obsessed by statistics. You know, if you 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 go run in the park and then Google gives you the trajectory and your speed and and so much data that when you can't replicate that, like in reading, it it may it may feel like you're stuck. And that is fair. That's unfair with the, with our energy and our dedication. Okay, and how learning, you know, that's how learning works. Uh, okay, number five. Let me see how we are with time. Okay, number five. We have twelve of those. Okay, guys. Uh, so five cheat, cheat. Um, there are plenty of sources to help you out. It's not. I, I really. Um, I have one of our professors, quite old guy, could speak like at, at, at a university, uh, could speak like 10, 11 languages or something. And, and he really like, imagine trying to learn 11 languages before the internet. It's like insane. I have no idea how the guy did it. Probably he came from another planet. Um, in our case, we, we have internet available and that is, uh, that is so amazing. Uh, it offers us so many opportunities to cheat, okay? So one thing that I always uh, advise our students to do is use annotated editions. Um, we only use here uh, the original texts, so we, we, we are not really up to, you know, manipulations and simplifications. We don't really like that. So we go for the originals. Uh, and we, we always go to the complete things. I abhor, okay? I detest. I hate with all my strength um, uh, uh, abridgments, okay? So some, this is quite, it's not so common in Portuguese, but it's very common in English that you get, you know, like war and peace with a huge volume like this, but, but then you buy it and you don't really know why, but it's like, it's just 400 pages rather than 1,500 because it's an abridged version, okay? They do this a lot in English, like condensing and taking out chapters and, 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 and paragraphs and stuff. So you have, it, it happened to me already that I had the impression that I had read uh, a certain book and actually I hadn't because I read an abridgment. So we, we, we only use the full-blown uh, full blown novels and the original texts. And, and, and therefore, um, one great thing to, to use is annotated editions. For example, last semester in the intermediate course, uh, we tried an experiment with our students uh, and we read The Turn of the Screw, okay? Very, it's very difficult. It's way beyond the intermediate level. It's from the 19th century. It's Henry James, great classic, an amazing short, an amazing novella, but very tough on vocabulary and very tough on syntax, okay? Uh, some students were fainting, others were crying uh, in class. I'm just joking, but... But it was a great experience. Everybody loved it. It was it was like quite challenging, but it was the good the good amount, you know, the good percentage. And one of the ways that we could affront such text that was beyond our league was precisely to by using an annotated edition. Okay, so then our students were reading. This is the uh, Webner's uh, Thesaurus edition. So uh, you can find many literary uh, literature classics that you can find those in such editions. Not only this one, but you have like uh, uh, Oxford Shakespeare, for example. Uh, you, you find the original text by Shakespeare with, with annotations on what the words mean and grammar, instructions, and things like that. So uh, there are many, many editions like those. So you have the original text here in the top. And then in this uh, gray box at the bottom, you have synonyms and explanations of what the words means and etc. So perhaps you will be reading that my fortitude mounted fresh and actually you would realize that this means my courage grew once again well much more palatable but still if i gave you my courage grew once again it's not quite the same thing you get the meaning but you don't get the the flavor the 19th century flavor uh, of the original and that uh, as a literary critic I could not do otherwise, you know, uh, somebody would be like destroying my diploma uh, somewhere in the WFPA, okay? So, 
So this is why we always go for, for the original. Use annotated editions, therefore. Another possibility, many of you already do that, I'm sure. Use Kindle. Kindle is great. You can, you know, touch the words. You get an instant um, um, English to English translation. If that's not enough, you, you, you can get it into the English to Portuguese. If that's not enough, you can go to, to Google Translate, which is also another great, great um, tool. Okay. One thing I do sometimes to, to practice German, uh, uh, let's say I'm in Wikipedia for some reason, I want to read an article about Bogota, for example. Uh, I'll try it in German first. Then I don't, I, I understand perhaps, I don't know, 60%. And then I use Google Translate to, to translate it to English. It's a bit broken, it's a bit weird, but it's good because kind of replicates the structure of German. And so it helps me out. And then I go back to the German and then it's much clearer, okay? So you could try something similar in whatever language you're studying, okay? Um, also in this direction, try using shorter text. Motivation is great. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the name of the game in here. When we're reading in a foreign language, to be motivated and to know why you're doing it and how you do it, this is the uh, this is the question. Okay, so so if if you don't have enough time or if you're struggling with motivation and you know your worst enemy is right here, because the moment you sit down to read that that book that you were waiting the entire week to do, you know you 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 made your tea or your coffee, you sit down. Uh, your boyfriend or kids or whatever, they're out of the house. You have two hours all for yourself. And then this shit starts to, to scream like, come watch me, TikTok and, and uh, instant messaging on WhatsApp or whatever. So uh, if time and motivation is an issue, try something more immediately rewarding. And what we mean by that is short stories, okay? Um, try reading short stories. I was not a big fan before I started teaching in, in a book a month. I usually go for novels, my personal preference, but, but I've been uh, reevaluating them because, you know, one, one example on how it could help uh, with a fluent language. Um, we have studied all these authors um, in a book a month, and with the exception of Hemingway, this this guy with an amazing beard right here. I'm, I'm very jealous. Um, uh, Hemingway is quite easy. That the language, the the literary structure is it's much it's much more complicated than it looks. Actually, it, he has the virtue of looking quite simple, but actually, you know, it's the only the tip of the iceberg. But if you try to read Edgar Allan Poe, amazing writer, quite difficult, however. Okay, and the same thing applies to Herman Melville. Okay, the, the, the author of Moby Dick and, and stuff, and Virginia Woolf. Uh, I love them both. And we have tried uh, uh, a year and a half ago to read Orlando by Virginia Woolf in a book a month. And it was quite an experience, but everybody wants to do it. And I highly recommend you read her. She's amazing, uh, but it's quite tough. And it's tough because of the language. And it's also tough because it's modernist literature at its best which means very tough, <laughs> okay? So um, perhaps if you try to read Mrs. Dalloway, for example, it's too much of a challenge, it's too long, it's, it's, it's not so palatable. The same applies to Moby Dick, but if you try reading Melville and Virginia Woolf by using short stories, for example, stories that are five pages long, 10 pages long, then it's okay. Even if it takes you 10 minutes per page, in the end of an hour, you, you have read the, the whole story through, you know? It's quite difficult. It's quite different uh, uh, that if, than if you had Moby Dick, because perhaps in the end of an hour, you read five pages of Moby Dick and you still have another, I don't know, 5,000 more to go or something. <laughs> okay, which is also an amazing book, really. Moby Dick, amazing. Uh, please read it before you die, okay? Uh, yeah, so number seven. You can try the short stories. Number seven, work on what you need 
rather than what you feel like, okay? Um, I've taken uh, dances of, um, classes of dancing for a few years. And, and one of my, my teachers would always say this, uh, because you know, you're good on certain things. And therefore, those things are pleasurable because you're good. The, the challenge is to, to feel pleasure when you suck, okay? When you try to, you know, you're awful at soccer. You're terrible. You're the worst. Therefore, I, I doubt that you will wake up one morning and say, you know what? This Sunday, I oh, will just play soccer the entire day. It's very unlikely that this will happen because if you're bad at it, you probably won't do it. And you're, it, since you won't do it, it means you're bad at it, you know? So you get into a vicious, vicious cycle. And that applies to life in general, but also to foreign languages, of course. So uh, practice on what you need rather than what you feel like it. This is much more difficult. It, it's much easier said than done, okay? One thing that I, that I advise, for example, for vocabulary is to use, uh, to practice spe spacious repetition. Uh, I don't know if you guys know what this is. Uh, there are certain apps that, for example, you're reading a book in English, and you've met this, this word, obnoxious. And then you're like, obnoxious, what the hell is that? So you look, uh, and then you type this. You open this app, and then you type there, obnoxious. And then you've learned that, oh, okay, it's weird and uncommon, exotic, whatever. And then you put it there. And in and, and, and these apps, once in a while, they will just throw you um, uh, the, the meaning. Okay, so they're just uh, you're using your telephone and then just like swiping up in TikTok, and then boom, uh, suddenly it will get give you the, the 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 meaning and it will appear in your screen, and and in this way you will withhold information for much longer. Okay, it will be easier to memorize. You can use this for to study language, but also to study I don't know anatomy or whatever. Okay, uh, you can create your own flashcards. You can I haven't done this. But I've met once a polyglot that could speak over 10 languages. And, and the guy um, was, and I'm not joking, this is real. The guy was copying the Plato's dialogues in ancient Greek by hand. Okay, so he was like, he, he, he was studying ancient Greek and he had the Plato's dialogues all about Socrates and stuff. And he was like copying it, the entire dialogues by hand as a way to practice his Greek. Okay. Quite extreme. I was like, well, still nowadays, I'm still puzzled by this, but, but it's something that, you know, you, you're using your motor skills. You're using an entire, you know, different range, regions of the brain, different sets of skills in your service. Okay. So it's not the easiest strategy, but it's possible. And, and I'm giving this example just for you guys to, to get the idea that you can get creative. Okay? You can invent your own techniques and like this guy clearly did because uh, yeah, it would not come uh, uh, naturally to me. Uh, yeah, let me just copy out uh, War and Peace by Tolstoy by, in my head. It means it, it's quite crazy. Okay. Uh, yes, Anna? Um, to share a quick tip. If you are Kindle users, Kindle does have a tool to create your own flashcards. You can just like click on the um, on the uh, word that you're going to select, and then you can add it to your personal account. I have actually done a reel about it a while ago. I can reshare tonight because I teach you how to do it on your uh, on your Kindle, right? So it, it helps a lot, right? With foreign languages, it's never enough to repeat and also to test yourself, right? To be able to see if you can remember the meaning, yes? Okay. Uh, we're almost there, guys. So number eight, did the slide change for you guys? Yeah, did it change? Okay. Um, another possibility, read more than once, okay? Uh, you can absorb so much in a second reading. Uh, I don't do it a lot, I have to confess, but, but many of our students do with very good results. So it's not very much my personal style, but, but I do think that's something um, that is really, really worthy of trying. 
uh, if you don't want to read the book twice, perhaps it's a short story, for example, it's easier. But the, because, you know, in a, on the first reading, you don't know what is going to happen. You don't know you, the style, the story, characters, whatever. Once after you read it, you know everything that will about, is about to happen. You, that, therefore, uh, your absorption will be uh, and, and your fixing of, of structures and vocabulary and, and cultural elements will, will be much greater and much more nuanced. Okay? Uh, you may try, if you don't want to read everything for a second turn, you may try dynamic reading. Okay? So you just like reread it quite fast, you know, like just shifting your, your eyes through the page, as we do sometimes in, you know, when you're scrolling in Facebook or when you're looking for some information in a website that you're not really reading everything, but you're like trying to read key sentences and trying to spot the, the most important information. You can try to do that, the same thing. Uh, another possibility to use audiobooks instead. I'm going to talk more about that in a, in a moment, but I'm a great fan. And, and I've, I've, this is something I use a lot. Okay? So, for example, um, two or three years ago, I was reading Sherlock Holmes in German as a way to, of, of practicing. And I was listening to the audiobook in English. Okay? So, so I was reading German and then listening in English because my German is not good. And, and I, was, uh, I, I slowed the, the reading. Uh, it, it was like a Nemo, like this, okay? Because I need, I cannot read German too fast. So I needed a slower English version in my ear. And, and therefore I was reading German, not really understanding much or understanding perhaps 60%, which is not enough for me to understand the story. And, and listening to the audiobook and therefore uh, grasping, uh, you know, uh, the words and, and the sentences and everything. Okay, so this is a very interesting strategy. Or you can try the movies, or you can try a graphic novel, whatever. Anything that will ha help you absorb it better. So different people learn in different ways. And therefore, you should be looking so what's best for your style of learning, your, your personal interests, and your, just your general mood. Because also, in different points in life, we, we, we try to, to approach learning um, via different paths. Okay? For example, if you're in the end of the semester, loaded with so many things uh, of, in university or in, at work or whatever, it's unlikely that you want to read a book twice just to practice your English. So perhaps you could try to read the graphic novel for, for a second reading or perhaps try a um, second book by the same author or watching the movie, something that happens a lot with our students. Last semester, we read The Hours by, by Michael Cunningham. And then there's the movie, right? The very nice movie with Nicole Kidman, perhaps. Uh, and well, I, I'm terrible with, with name of, of uh, actors and actresses, but I don't know, three very famous uh, uh, women actresses. Uh, and, and so many of our, our students were reading the novel and then watching the movie and then commenting on the difference, in, uh, et cetera. Okay? And, it, and you could do even the opposite, watching the movie first and going to the novel later, things like that. Okay? No, Nicole Kidman. Yeah, is that is it that? Okay, anyway. Um, so uh, another thing that, um, uh, that our students uh, do quite frequently, uh, uh, two years ago, uh, Anna was teaching Through the Looking Glass uh, by Lewis Carroll. This is Alice in Wonderland is part one. So Alice Through the Looking Glass is part two, okay? And, and perhaps you're like, what, Through the Looking Glass? You kind of understand looking, you kind of understand glass, or, not kind of, you do understand looking, you do understand glass, but looking glass, well, usually we're more familiar with the word mirror, right? The word looking glass is an older word to say mirror. So that's why when, immediately when you get to Alicia, Alicia Traves de Spiegel, immediately you get this kind of, of comparison that you get to a, a second reading and not, nobody said that the second reading had to be in the same language, okay? So, this is something that happens with, with um, uh, a particular student. Um, he was having difficulties with the book. It's, it's more challenging than it, you might expect. 
and, and therefore he read it first in Portuguese and then he came back to, to the English version and read it for the second time in English and then it was smooth because yes, there were linguistic challenges, but at least the, the literary challenges were already dealt with, you know? So it was, it was much easier and also to guess uh, what words meant and what certain structures meant, etc. Okay. Another possibility, discuss. Um, debating is really uh, one of the best ways of studying literature. Uh, at least that's my personal opinion uh, and my experience as a teacher. Um, I, I've always been the kind of reader that wants to discuss books with other people and, and my friends have suffered a lot because of that. <laughs> because if I'm reading something nice, I will have to tell you. Okay, it's a, you will have to prove to prove your loyalty and your friendship by listening. You know, some people want to talk about their girlfriends or about uh, their you know their problems. I want to talk about literature. Uh, so um, discussing and joining book clubs may really be a great way to to not only to develop your interpretation skills and your um, uh, rationale for, for, for literature in general, but, but also it offers you these secondary advantages, which are pretty awesome. That is, you have to debate and you, you have to use your reading in English to practice conversation, right? And so this is pretty cool. And, and this will give you, um, uh, social exchange, which is something, you know, we have all, all of us, we've been through the lockdown and we have all had the, the we have all witnessed uh, the effect that uh, lacking social uh, uh, connections, uh, the defect that it has in our lives. So one way of, of uh, tackling that is precisely discussing literature. And one great thing is that when you start to explain your ideas and your interpretations, you realize that you realize many things that you had not realized before. You know so much more than you know that you know. You know, <laughs> quite a complex sentence, but it makes sense. It, it makes sense. Okay, you know so much more that you know that you know you know. Okay, uh, going uh, further. Um, to say something about like uh, discussing books in group like how often do you find a wide group of people reading the same book or the same short story as you are reading at the moment it's rare people unless uh, we are talking about very famous novels like usually contemporary novels that have been uh, just launched and caught the attention of the public. For example, last year with Torto Arado, right, which was uh, a great novel that everybody was reading at the, at the same time and commenting about it. It's pretty rare for you to find out a group of people that is reading the same thing as you. So the one thing, uh, I think that's the, the number one benefit of it is just like being able to talk to people that actually know what you're talking about when you express your emotions concerning that a uh, specific novel or when you want to discuss uh, that specific character and then uh, bring some of uh, your comments to discuss. So I think it's uh, a win-win situation, right? Okay, uh, guys, I'll speak for only 10 minutes more and then uh, I'll, I'll answer to questions and Anna can comment if you guys have any suggestions, uh, criticism or whatever, okay? Uh, number 10, listen to audiobooks okay i know uh, many people have not tried so, uh, <clears throat> many people have tried and did not like it uh, but i do warmly suggest you to give it another try if you don't like it and if you didn't try it because I, I find audiobooks amazing amazing i love them uh, not only because they save you time for the you know the we all have to do from time to time boring stuff you have to go to the train to to make your uh you know your to get your driver's license once again and then you'll be for like two hours waiting 
perhaps you cannot really bring a book along so you can listen to an audiobook or you have to do the dishes. And trust me, once you start loving audiobooks, the dishes will never be the same again. Uh, here, we fight for to, to know who, you know, no, I'm doing the dishes. You did it last time. Get out of here. It's exactly like this. Because doing the dishes is perfect. It's perfect time for audiobook, okay? So it saves a lot of time. But also, it adds another layer of possibilities. Certain narratives do not fit well with audiobooks so, because they are too complex, too experimental. Uh, Mrs. Dalloway, for example, by Virginia Woolf. It's very complicated. So it's complicated if you're reading. You have sometimes you have to go back some pages and read a few things back again. Then you're like, ah, okay, so this person is that person. Then you go forward again. So it's complicated. So it's better for reading. If you try to listen to it, uh, you're likely to get lost. However, there are certain other narratives they get enriched when you try listening audiobooks. And I can give you two examples. I have spoken about uh, the hunting of, of Hill House, right? It's a ghost story. And, and uh, I, I've listened to the audiobook. So I read it by, with my ears, okay? And, and it, it was amazing because, you know, they put it the music, they create the ambiance. And at some part, part, please pardon my French, but... But one day I was like shitting myself over, like listening to the audiobook at 2 a.m. I was like, wow, that, it's very, very scary, precisely because you have all the sound effects and the voices and everything. So it's pretty cool. It's, it's like watching Netflix without the images, okay? And with very good, high quality text. Um, so it was great. Another example is when you get regional dialects, okay? So if you're reading um, Of Mice and Men, by Steinbeck, which I've mentioned uh, before, it's very cool to get, you know, someone with a Texan accent reading, yeah, you know, you know, like getting the getting you into the mood, getting it into the feeling. Uh, a few years ago, I've, I've listened to uh, um, Their Eyes Were Watching God, for example, by, by Zora Neale Hurston. Um, and she's an Afro-American from, from the South. Uh, writing in the 1930s and 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 she's all about like you know like regional dia black dialect and it's amazing like uh, sometimes a little bit difficult to understand but it gives you so much flavor uh, and you know sometimes when you're reading Machado de Assis for example I read it when I was at high school and then when I got to university the first semester one of my professors at my very first uh, discipline of uh, literary theory in, in university. And, and the professor was talking about because Machado is a, ma it's a, he's a master of irony. It's so funny. And I was like, what? Funny? Uh, like, really? No Casmo, funny? What the hell? And, and, and yeah, once you, you know, because it's difficult sometimes to spot the sarcasm, the irony, when it's just written. But, but you know, friends are being sarcastic you know instinctively, you know, because you get the tone of voice, you get the speed in which they speak, you get so many, there are so many things, you know, the pronunciation, everything, they give you little tips on uh, if they're being serious or not, if they're being playful or not. And, and this also uh, is true about audiobooks, okay? So yeah, it's, it's a, they save you a lot of time and they really add up uh, your reading. Number 11, enjoy the challenge. Okay, it requires a lot of active effort. Um, please don't think that I'm saying that if you're basic one in Turkish and then you just start reading and at some point or, or just start watching uh, Turkish series in Netflix and after 378 episodes, you'll be a fluent speaking, uh, speaking Turkish fluently. That's not what I'm saying. It will help, definitely. You will learn a thing or two, but it will not get you uh, into a fluent speaker unless you are a child up to six or seven years old. Then probably it will be your case. You will learn Turkish. But if you're an adult, forget it, okay? But, but it, 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 learning languages require an active effort. And so if we, if we can meet uh, a perspective, 
if we can develop perspective that gets pleasure and excitement out of this effort, okay? You know, a struggle doesn't have to be bad. And for example, um, many of you have hold degrees in universities, for example, and I'm sure it has been tough. Or you can think about some of the things that you value the most in life. They are valuable precisely because they were difficult to get, you know? So there is a high value and of, of you know, positive and pleasurable things uh, in, into effort. And this is something we have to, to, to think actively about when we're studying something um, with our might. And this could be foreign languages, this could be mathematics, could be anything, okay? Above all, okay, keep calm and read on. Everything will be fine in the end. Um, so very briefly, another five minutes and I'm done uh, to explain to you guys how does a book a month uh, work. Many of you guys already know it. Fast, if you guys, uh, we offer two different types of courses, novels in which we read a book a month. So there you go. That's the name of the school. Or we read short stories, okay? It depends which one is the best for you. It depends on how much you would like to read, how much time you have at your disposal, okay? Another thing you should consider is how often you would like to come to classes. Um, because we have certain courses are week on a weekly basis. So you have classes every Thursday or every Wednesday. And, and other, other courses are bi-weekly. Uh, so you, you have classes this week and then you the next one you're, you're off and then you're on again and then you're off again and, and then therefore you go, okay? Once you've decided on those two things, you can, you can decide what, what is the course for you. Um, we, in the novels course, uh, this is the reading list for the intermediate. We, we offer it in two levels, intermediate and advanced. And we're thinking about um, a linguistic, um, linguistics basically. So. Uh, we we're looking for a more simple, simpler vocabulary and simpler uh, grammar, but not necessarily simpler literature. Okay, so it's a, it's also high value and very artistic as well. We usually organize our courses by themes. So this time we'll be talking about happiness, uh, the happy days. Uh, and whatever that means. Um, and, and so we'll start with the Wizard of Oz, a great allegory of, um, of life in general, of, of searches and etc. We all know the story, the, the Yellow Brick Road and so on. Uh, we'll read then Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse, a great Nobel Prize, a German writer, but we we'll read it in translation. This is something about a book a month. We read mostly texts in English, but or originally written in English, but we often um, every now and then try authors from different languages because they have a very high quality. So Siddhartha is about uh, Buddhism. It's based on the life of Buddha. It's a very poetic novel, very highly spiritual. Then we'll move into Camus, great, the great philosopher of the nine, of 20th century, the stranger, who is stranger in Portuguese. And, and it's actually it's about the lack of happiness or uh, <laughs> rather than being about the happy days, right? Then a great classic of the 19th century, actually the, the early 20th century, The Secret Garden, okay? Um, which has been turned into uncountable movies and, and yeah, so many adaptations. And finally, my favorite of these ones, uh, John Steinbeck, The Canary Row, okay? A great novel about friendship, uh, about a group of friends that try to throw a party, a surprise party, and end up destroying everything. So it's a little bit, a little bit like Sidney but literary version. Okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, in the advanced course, we'll be talking about one of our favorite actions in life, which is traveling. Okay. I I I guess that many of you would agree. Uh, and in this one, we we've, we've put up uh, a few heavy weights. Uh, heavy champions together, okay? So we'll start with Ernest Hemingway, perhaps his masterpiece, The Sun Also Rises. Then we'll move into uh, Jack Kerouac's The Dharma Bums. Kerouac is quite famous for On the Road, right? This one is the sequel, 
Okay, so On the Road is a bit too long for, for our purposes, so we decided to get this, this is the sequel. It's about two friends that are hitchhiking together. They, they go on trekking and mountain climbing and everything. It's quite interesting. They're talking a lot about, about life and stuff. Uh, then um, The Great Discovery of the Semester, Pearl S. Buck, amazing writer that won the Nobel and the Pulitzer. Okay, so... Uh, the, the, perhaps the two biggest prizes in literature. She, she won both of them. Um, and for whatever reason, she's not as well known as she deserves. Uh, we will read East Wind, West Wind, one of her earlier novels. And it's quite short, so about 120 pages long. Then we'll move into sci-fi, uh, Ursula Le Guin, The Left Hand of Darkness, uh, a very interesting narrative about a planet in which there is no gender. Everybody is male and female. Not exactly hermaphrodite. It's not exactly the idea. The idea is that all individuals can become pregnant. And, and this changes society in such a crazy way. So, so you're reading about aliens that can get pregnant, every single one of them. And it's, it's pretty crazy. And it's a total masterpiece. Uh, so it reads like uh, the work of an anthropologist. It's very, very interesting. And then we move into Salman Rushdie. Uh, an author that is has won every major literary prize is still alive, uh, 85, up and going. And this is, is called Harun and the Sea of Stories, a very funny book, quite complicated, but it's a young adult novel and loosely based on The Thousand and One Nights. He's, he's Indian. He was born and, and raised in India. So this is also something we try to do here to approach not English literature, but literature in English, that's totally different, okay? Uh, it, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't look as much, right? But it, it's, a, it's a very big um, uh, difference. And finally, in the short stories course, we do not really organize, the, uh, organize it, this course thematically. Uh, what we do, we try to offer a mosaic of different authors. So you, you, you know, it's like in a banquet, you can try a little bit of everything. So we would be reading a lot of, we, we try to focus more on, on female writers, so women writers, and we'll be starting with Kate Chopin, a great uh, writer from, from the US, Agatha Christie, then Eileen Chang, one of the best in, in Chinese literature in the 20th century, Herman Melville, um, then uh, Alice Walker, the, the, the author of The Color Purple, has won major literary prizes and she's still alive, H.B. Uh, Lovecraft, the master of horror. Uh, who I'm looking to you. Uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, okay. Uh, very interesting author of the 19th century, early feminist, etc. Virginia Woolf, does not require any introduction. And Thomas Mann, okay. Uh, a little bit of German authors in here. Uh, Nobel Prize. And, and, and as, as we all know, he's almost incapable of writing short stuff. So we really, you know, like the Magic Mountain, Dr. Faustus, uh, Joseph and his brothers, everything is like uh, higher than my arm. So, so yeah, uh, we, we could find a little, uh, some shorter texts and we will be exploring those. The short stories course is only weekly. And then the novels course um, in the advance is only once every two weeks, but in the intermediate, you can choose if you want to do it weekly or once every two weeks. It depends on you, okay? It depends on how much English you want to write. I think that's all, guys. I'll just jump this because I don't want to, to take too much of your time. Uh, another thing that you could try is to stack habits, okay? If you like uh, getting your coffee in the morning, uh, you may try getting the coffee and reading at the same time. So you stack, you know, you pile up your habits. This, uh, this helps a lot uh, sometimes. Yes, Anna? Uh, a comment that um, it came to me right now because uh, earlier today I responded a comment on our Instagram about this it was this girl asking if by any chance we offer certificates um, in our courses right and we do right and this is something that you can also use in order to prove your extracurricular activities in the university so usually how we do it uh, which I think is very fair to do it. I, I've learned uh, to compute 
the hours, the amount of hours that we dedicate into a course like this when I was studying in England, which is we not only compute the time that we are in class, but also the time that you're dedicating to reading, right? Because it's a lot. you be probably dedicating, I don't know, uh, 10 hours of your time, six hours of your time. So this should be computed throughout the semester. And then by the end uh, of the course, of the five month course, if you do it um, uh, the whole period, then you will earn a 60 hour um, uh, certificate, right? Which is a lot. It's equivalent for you to do in like um, a discipline in university. So sometimes it counts for you. I don't know if you're still doing your degree, but if it does, then it's good uh, for you to to prove your extracurricular hours. And also you can include these on your um, uh, lattice curriculum, right? If you are uh, in the academic side. Yeah, so it helps a lot. Okay, to finish a few practical, if you, if you might be considering joining us, uh, if we'll have this honor, uh, the, here are some practical information. So the schedule of which courses are happening when, okay? So on Tuesday, Every Tuesday, short stories. Every Wednesday, there's one version of the novel, Intermediate. And then on Thursdays, you have bi-weekly. On one week, uh, you, you may choose from novels, Intermediate, or novels, Advanced, bi-weekly. And also on Saturday afternoons, we also offer it bi-weekly. So once, two, two Saturdays a month, you'll be spending your afternoon with us. When, when you're having classes weekly, classes are shorter. They, they last for an hour and a half. When it's only uh, it's when it when it takes two weeks, uh, classes are longer. So we do actually two pieces of one hour and fifty. So you commit to two hours and a half actually. Uh, so yeah, you decide if you prefer shorter classes often or less often but longer ones. Okay, uh, these are the prices. Okay, um, we have a few different types of packages if you want to different prices of, of courses and. And, and one of them is the uh, free access to everything all the time. Um, yeah, uh, so you can find all of these in our Instagram and everything. And about the start of the classes, um, we start all of them in February on the, on the 7th, we start with Kate Chopin and the short stories uh, with The Wizard of Oz in the novels intermediate, either on the 8th or on the 9th. It depends if it's weekly or, or bi-weekly. And in the novels advanced, either on the 11th or on the 16th, if it's on Thursday or on Saturday, we'll be discussing the sun also rises, okay? So at the bottom line, if you guys are joining us, we promise you two things, lots of learning, both in literature and language, but also a lot of fun, okay? Uh, thank you so much, guys. And please uh, speak. Uh, and if you have any questions or any advice, we are here. Thank you so much for your attention. Questions at all, people? Um, I I do have a question. I don't know how to raise my hand anymore in here. Um, but um, I've read that Audio is a huge specialist on um, humanidades médicas, é assim, né? And I teach. Yes, and I teach for medical students, and we focus on academic reading. And I, I'm sorry, I was in a parents teachers meeting, and I got a little late. So I, I'm not sure if any of the first tips were could help me on that. But if you had anything on that, it would be great. <laughs> tips on academic uh, reading. Academic reading, yes. No, good question. Yeah. Um, well, grasping the terminology certainly helped, right? So, yeah, I would say this is, is key. Uh, I use a lot of, uh, of Google Translate because it translates quite well uh, academic stuff, right? Google has a little bit more difficulties with colloquial language. So, weirdly enough, the simpler it gets, sometimes it gets fuzzy. But... In German, I use it. I don't read a lot of academic German, but I do read a lot of academic Italian, and and academic Italian is very complicated. You know, uh, in English, academic English phrases, short sentences, uh, you know, like they repeat a lot. 
uh, Italian is the complete opposite. They love, you know, like this very complicated, like, you know, a lot of, you, you, you stack five sentences, one inside the other, and, and you're, you know those, those Russian dolls that, you know, this is how they write in Italian. It's beautiful. It's amazing. But it's quite complicated to get. Uh, and so sometimes I do use that just to, to, to you know, ping pong to see if I'm, if I'm getting it correctly. What else? I'll think about it a little bit more. And uh, yeah, if something comes to mind, I'll, I'll let you know. And, you know, I'm going to be your student with the advanced novels. So if awesome. any Saturday you remember something <laughs> like that, I'm up here, you know. That's great. Thank you so much. But just uh, one thing that also can help, not specifically with medical humanities, but with specific terms. Whatever helps me when I am translating some text or if I want to search for a specific uh, terminology of a specific area, usually I Google the, um, uh, the term in Portuguese, I access the, the page on Wikipedia, and then I choose the language that I want to, um, to get the translation to, because then you get, you're sure you're going to be getting the official name of it, right? Because Wikipedia is thoroughly edited. I think in Brazil, we still need to improve it, but in other languages like in German, like in, in English, in French, we always have maintenance of experts and academics who do that. So you can usually trust it. So it's, it's a good tip as well. Anything else, guys? It, for those that are going, Thank you so much for your presence, okay? Please go, no hard feelings. But if you have any other questions, please let us know. I could not follow the chat while I was speaking, but uh, I saw that it was like going wild, like 80 something comments. Or... Yes, Anna, go ahead. Just if you could talk about the, um, the apps to, to do like spacious um, vocabulary, like you keep repeating it. I gave some recommendation but as I don't use it that often, so maybe if you remember, do you have any apps, any website? I suggested Quizlet and vocabulary.com, but I'm not sure if you, if you have any other. Someone asked in the chat if this will be, if you have access to the recording, you do. Um, we have a page in YouTube for a book a month and it will be there. Okay, so if even if you if you want to share these with someone, you can also do it, uh, yeah, and rewatch it later on. Okay, guys, and I think uh, is that all. Any, any other questions? No? Okay. So thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, oh, yeah, no, there, actually there is one. Uh, if the short stories course is to any level, yes, it is for, for both the intermediate, up from, from intermediate onwards, right? Yes, Anna, go ahead. Um, so, sorry, I am struggling with uh, both the the, the to keep the, the phones and, and uh, using the microphone. So the thing is, uh, the short stories, it's a multi-level uh, group, right? So uh, in, to achieve like this multi-level group, I, use, uh, use, I teach short stories, right? So this is uh, what I'm telling you. I use the multi-level method, which is I usually group people who have like different levels, some advanced, some intermediary, uh, intermediate, mostly because one helps the other, right? So sometimes the doubt of the intermediate uh, student is also the same doubt of the advanced. So it should be corrected even if it's in a later uh, stage of the learning process and uh, vice versa. Usually if you are studying with more advanced students, uh, you in, I mean, like it's never a competition. It's never, it's always a safe space. Everybody respects itself. Nobody makes fun of anyone. Um, and usually people help each other, right? So help with pronunciation, they help with um, uh, sharing their, their sources of uh, better learning. So it's always good to be in contact with people that are a little bit ahead of you 
And I say that to myself, like when, when I, I did that course uh, of German that I mentioned to you, I was having classes with a boy and he was super good in German. Sometimes I would feel like, oh, am I ever going to be in, in his level? But then I, I think uh, because of him, I got really motivated into improving and to see uh, the, the stage where I could, um, what I could become and what I could achieve by the end of the course, right? So it's really good, it helps a lot. But if you're intimidated on, then you're on. Yeah, we're really for horizontal learning. You know, uh, this is something we discuss a lot with our students. Uh, learning is not something that you should give it for granted and that you should receive entirely ready. Actually, learning is a, it's a process that goes both way and students are also responsible for their own learning. Uh, and, and, and what I mean is you have to realize what your, what, what, what your difficulties are and how you tackle that. And, you, and, and one of the great things about a book a month is that we, we keep the groups small and we, we are quite close with our students. And so you have free direct access to us and we can get, give you tips you know, outside of classes, like try this, try that. Some students um, in the intermediate level uh, sometimes wish to get classes on the side we do not really do that like we're not teaching language anymore we did that for many years but but we're not doing it any longer so we but we we do know very well, a lot of extremely efficient and, and skilled professionals that we could um you know we could put you in contact with them and they could work in tandem uh, alongside with a book a month it is a great combination one day I hope to find exactly this for German. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Take German uh, classes on the side and be reading like crazy uh, in, in, in German version of a Ein Buch, Ein Monat in, in German, auf Deutsch. Uh, und dann uh, I will speak uh, finally uh, this crazy, crazy language. Okay. Uh, yep. Yep. <laughs> Okay, guys, I think so. I think that's it. We've promised that we would last, the class would last until, uh, it, it would last for an hour and a half. We, we started with five minutes delay, so we're delivering exactly one hour and a half, okay? Thank you so much for your presence and for your trust, and hope to see you again anytime soon in our classes or in the open classes, okay? All the best, guys. Take care. Thank you, everyone. So I'll keep you posted, okay? See you. Bye-bye.